So when it comes to discrimination, I think we first need to be clear on exactly what we mean, because a lot of people throw around related terms like racism and discrimination and prejudice. And so when people talk about what would happen in a purely free market that the government doesn't regulate, and then compare it to what we have in our great system now because of the benevolence of wise politicians in the past and the laws that they passed, I think we need to be clear. So most people, they don't have a problem with racism or prejudice per se, as long as it didn't influence your outward behavior. And so, you know, suppose I'm walking around and I just really hate people from Switzerland. I can't stand them. But you wouldn't know that from talking to me, okay? And that in my behavior when I hire people and when I make decisions where I go to eat and things like that, you had no idea that I harbored this inner prejudice, then I think most people would say, okay, you shouldn't be penalized for that, because that really would be thought control. And even most of our opponents at least would say that, you know, we're not in the business of thought control. Some people would probably argue with that claim, but I think that most of them would admit that, no, we're not trying to penalize what goes on in your head. We're trying to make sure you don't act unfairly and really harm someone else's livelihood. So really what we're talking about when we talk about what sort of things is the government supposed to make sure don't happen that would happen if we had a free, unregulated market, really the term would be discrimination, where someone is treated unfairly because of perhaps the prejudices or racism harbored by the person with power. And so before we really analyze that, though, let me give you some examples just to clarify our thinking here. So some of you may have watched the movie The Hour. It was a very star-studded cast of actresses, and one of them was Nicole Kidman was playing the role of, she was Virginia Woolf, the author. Now, now, what if when they were casting for that role and they had people coming in and, you know, Nicole Kidman came in and other famous actresses may have come in and read for the part. Suppose Dustin Hoffman walked in and he had the script and he was getting ready to read for the part. And you can imagine people would have, it would have been sort of uncomfortable and, and they would have, you know, been, you know, there would have been, you know, uh, people talking and whispering. And he starts reading the lines and they go through it and they say, well, thank you, Mr. Hoffman, you know, really respect your work, but I, I don't think you're right for the part. And suppose he kept pressing them. And he said, what, what, you think I'm a bad actor? You don't, you don't like the way I read that line? You, don't, you didn't believe that I was really into the character? And eventually, the answer would have to be, well, well no, you're, you're a man. And you, know, you, you can't possibly hire you for this position. And he could say, no, I could play a woman. I was in Tootsie. I mean, didn't you like what I did there? Right? So he can convincingly play a woman. And again, though, you, you think, well, no, because if we cast you, that would just distract people. You know, they'd be watching the movie, and they would know it was you. And, it just wouldn't fit. And so really, if you think about it, the reason he would be denied that job is that he was a man. That would be the fundamental reason. I mean, they might try to address it up, but that would be the reason. Now, is that unfair sexual discrimination? Is that something that we need to pass laws against? Most people wouldn't be too outraged over that. And you would say it's not just that Dustin Hoffman is a famous actor and he's rich and he doesn't you know, need the law to protect him. I mean, even if you look at community theater where people were struggling and eating ramen every, every night of the week and they were trying to get a part if someone were trying to play a historical figure and wanted to be something that they weren't, uh, probably people wouldn't think that that was outrageous. And that's not what we mean when we say we're against the sort of discrimination that would happen, allegedly, in a purely free market. Uh, another example, and a lot of, uh, I'm not the first to mention this one, if you look at the NBA, obviously the proportion of black players there is far greater than their sample in the population at large, or their proportion of the population at large, and is that prima facie evidence of rampant bias in the NBA? And most people, again, would, would say probably not. Now, if you do talk to some people, and I, I have, I'm certainly not um, the caliber myself, but I know some, some people who played professional uh, sports, and uh, upper level college sports, and they, and they do say that, yeah, there, there are biases, and that if you're a white guy, they, that it's harder for you to to uh, make it a certain basketball team. I, I can't confirm that, like I say, but there is that. But I think the, the overall uh, majority of the population would believe that, no, there's not rampant, outrageous discrimination in the NBA, that there are other reasons that lead to that outcome. It's not discrimination. All right, so there's all, there's all kinds of cases like this that you can go through that, you know, there aren't that many women probably who are coal miners, things like that. And it's, again, not necessarily that it's because of just pure discrimination. So you can go through all kinds of cases like that. So, so what, it, what is it exactly that people mean when they talk about discrimination? So we know it's not merely the fact of 
hiring some making a hiring decision based on someone's characteristics you know their race or their sex because the Dustin Hoffman case proves that well no that's not really what it is and then it's also not just if the pool of your employees don't exactly mirror those ratios that are in the population at large because that's the NBA case rules that out and so really if you push somebody and you say what is it that you're afraid would happen in a free market that you think is really unfair and we need to have laws against it if you push them to be really specific I think they would have to say okay if you had two candidates and one of them could do whatever the job was better than the other candidate and again taking all the factors into consideration really if one candidate would give more to the firm's bottom line if this candidate would be more productive and the employer because of his prejudice hired the other candidate and that's what we mean by discrimination okay and that's what needs to be penalized either fined or you know even having jail terms what have you in a in a that was what would happen in a free market and that's what the government needs to protect us from okay but if that's what we mean by discrimination well then those laws are superfluous because the free market automatically penalizes that all right and not only does the free market automatically penalize discrimination the way I've just defined it it does it in exactly the right proportion commensurate with how much or how bad the discrimination is all right so for example if if somebody hires uh, his brother-in-law over some other candidate most people would say okay he shouldn't be beheaded all right that's that would be a, a punishment exceeding what the crime was right so there should be some fine or there should be some sort of uh, punishment but you don't want to cut the guy's head off for doing that and so if you start thinking okay well well what how should we gauge it and again it should have something to do with well how gross was the uh, the nepotism in this case right if the, if the two candidates were pretty similar in their productivity but he you know gave a slight preference for his brother-in-law even though the guy maybe wasn't quite as qualified then he should be fine but not not that much right whereas if you had two candidates and one person was just a top flight candidate it was clear he had all the degrees from the right universities and the other guy was just a complete hack and he was just hiring this guy because he's a, you know my religion and I don't like this other guy well then you, people might say well his fine should be heavier in that case because that's just an extremely biased prejudiced decision whereas the guy who hired his brother-in-law if it was really close maybe he wasn't even conscious of what he was doing right that just think about it you've got two candidates one of them all things considered would bring in a hundred thousand dollars to the firm the other candidate would bring in a hundred and ten thousand dollars to the firm all right and let's say the salary you're gonna pay is eighty five thousand and so the employer knows that if he, if he hires the candidate who, who brings in less then he's automatically losing out on that extra money that he could have had all right so it's it's not a fine in the sense that it's money taken from his bank account but it's potential income that he could have had and so by hiring the one because you know he looks like me or I don't like Muslims or whatever the reason is that he's not hiring the more qualified candidate then he is effectively leaving money on the table there and the beauty of this is that you don't need to have inspectors going out and trying to find it this happens automatically anytime an employer does that automatically if he hires somebody who's less qualified because of truly irrelevant characteristics then that's potential profit he could have been earning that he's now not getting because of his bias All right, and that happens automatically he doesn't need to be caught by his shareholders it doesn't need to you know someone doesn't need to go through the books and then realize after the fact and go back and, and rectify it. it happens automatically he's leaving money on the table okay so that's that's just one example now when you, when you say something like that you, you, people who are dead set against that mentality they could be nodding their heads but thinking okay I'm not sure exactly where the mistake in your logic is but I know you're wrong that that's wrong I mean just open your eyes look around even the United States let alone the rest of the world and you mean to tell me with a straight face that there's not an injustice out there that there aren't huge disparate income or outcomes that seem to fall on certain groups who happen to also be unpopular and you're telling me that that's just fine that no those people are all you know they're getting a, a fair deal and and no in general I would say no that's that's not what I'm saying but the problem is not with the free market okay so one thing is we don't have a free market so it's always difficult to argue like this because it sounds like you're defending the status quo when that's not really the case and so for example in, in government uh, government projects like if the government wants to build a building or do anything like that where they put it out for bids there are certain uh, regulations in place that had to do with the union movement so that for example you have to pay the prevailing wages when they when they put out a bid I think it goes back to the Davis Bacon Act 
when they when the government puts out a bid for a contract it can't just give it to the low bidder again assuming that the person seems reputable and they can do the job it's not allowed to do that if the bid is so low that it's less than the prevailing wages would dictate i mean this is a stork the record the senators and people who voted for this act were clearly racist and that was their motivation they were saying we're afraid of this this was back in the early one thousand nine hundred saying we were afraid of colored labor coming up and competing with white unions and it would demoralize wage rates and things like that so they were worried about you've got these white unions and the government's bidding on projects and then we've got all these what they were calling colored workers coming up from the south and they're saying we could do that job we can build that building for you know fifty percent of what these white unions are charging you and so the government it didn't want to blatantly just say no we're going to give it to the white union because that would be obvious and so instead they passed this act which said the government is not allowed to pay less than some fraction of the prevailing wages in the region which of course would include the wages of these white union workers were getting all right so it was a a subtle way to funnel tax dollars into the hands of politically powerful unions who happen to be made up of white people and then these black contractors couldn't get the work all right so that was certainly racism that was institutionalized racism and yet that probably is uh, you know a feather in the cap of the labor movement to say look at this great thing that we did in american history and if you heard about the davis bacon act in your schools i'm sure most people probably would not point to that and say this was an example of institutionalized racism and again but you can go read the quotes and some of this is in my book of the people when they passed it what they were saying in defense of it so i'm not just speculating as to what their motives must have been you can you can see what they are what their arguments were